So last week I began a, a new series in the book of James. And my last week's message was on the first 12 verses of James in chapter 1. And James shares uh, some of the insights, and it's interesting, with the week that we've had and the weeks that we've had, he shares some insights and some thoughts into how God uses the trials and tribulations of various kinds that we go through in our lives to uh, test our faith. And he does that to develop within us perseverance. And, and perseverance must finish its course so that the people of God can become like Jesus. And God's desire is that each one of us um, adopts the attitude of Christ. And, and that attitude doesn't come naturally to us. It's something that's forged sometimes through the crucible of adversity. And so the Bible says in, in James chapter 1, right off the start, count it all joy when you encounter trials of diverse kinds, of various kinds. Count it all joy. Well, that's easy for us to say right here, right? But when you go through it, it's not all that easy to count it all joy when things are going wrong. We know this. Well, we're going to continue from uh, verse 12 and start into the next part of James chapter 1. See, the first part, uh, James talks about trials and tribulations in a broad sense. Uh, the diversity of trials and tribulations that come into our lives. And uh, now, in that, he wants to, uh, to go deeper with this. There's a certain kind of trial and tribulation that comes to us, and that is temptation. Now, when you're tempted and when you go through things, things don't go right or you, uh, you see evil um, tempting you, or you're tried by evil circumstances, maybe someone's uh, trying to get you, they're not being very nice to you, a relative, a friend, someone is, is testing you, or you're tempted. Well, in the days of the writing of the book of James, there was a certain prevalent teaching amongst certain rabbis in that day that suggested within every person was a good tendency, and in Hebrew, Yester Hatob, that's what they, Yetzer Hatob. And there's also an evil tendency, Yetzer Hera. And because of these two different tendencies, they were arguing that since God created everything, then God must have created the Yetzer Hara, or the evil tendency in man, along with the good. And you kind of have that philosophy that's taught in Eastern religion as well. So it's a common thought. And it, wasn't, uh, it was something that was prevalent amongst certain rabbis in the first century. The problem with this, though, is that when people encounter difficulties or evil comes at them or they're tempted to do evil, and that's a trial, they might just try thinking that maybe God is the author of that. That God is to blame for that. Inevitably, when you take that thought to its full course, that God is actually to blame for the sin in this world. In James chapter 113, the pivot of James's instruction to the saints shifts from general tribe trials and temptations, or general trials and tests, I should say, and shifts to specific trials and tests in the form of temptations. And he speaks about the source of temptation. My message this morning is understanding the nature of temptation. You see, 
The fact is, trial and temptation are very similar in wording in the, old, in the, in the New Testament Greek. They're very closely associated. When you go into a trial, that trial can very easily uh, become a temptation for you. It can morph into a temptation. A person who, for instance, painfully uh, is stretched to the limit in their finances, that's a trial, right? I don't know about you guys, but there's been times in my life, especially in my younger years, that I had financial stresses that were significant. That was a trial. That was a test. Rejoice in that. It's hard to rejoice in that when, you know, the cupboards are bare and you don't have enough at the end of the month to pay your rent. It's difficult to rejoice and be thankful for that. But you can see how a person who has that circumstance they might be tempted to embezzle money or to steal. A person who finds themselves in humble circumstances materially might just be tempted to be jealous of the person who appears to be blessed with the perfect job, a nice car, and a nice home. Well, how about this? A person who is having difficulty with one particular brother or sister in Christ in a church who has hurt them might be tempted to neglect fellowship altogether and just back away. A person who feels frustrated with having their car break, break down might be tempted to vent their anger on a family member, maybe your spouse or your, uh, or your child, who was actually driving that car when it broke down, trying to figure out what they did wrong. It's, there's a temptation to lose your temper. What did you do to that thing? You know, Yelling at a family member or getting upset who just hap- at, at someone who just happened to be in the driver's seat when the breakdown occurred. And maybe they were responsible for doing something wrong I remember one time I was, I was in my dad's pickup truck. He lent me his pickup truck, and it was a standard. And I was going with my buddies fishing. So we went down to this lake, and the water level was fairly low in the lake, so we had to kind of drop over the edge to get the boat down to the water because there was this edge all around the lake, and the boat launch was kind of meant for when the water was higher. So I dropped down over the edge of this lip there and dumped the boat back in there, and... You know, I was a rookie driver. I tried to get out of that place. And I burned his clutch so bad. Oh, oh man. It was bad, right? I burned that clutch. And uh, it shuddered and it shook when you tried to shift after that. My dad was so upset. I mean, I can't remember exactly how he put it. But, um, yeah, I wasn't very popular for a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> but, you, you, you know, when you're in that situation and your dad, right, and your kid does something crazy or silly or maybe something just happens. I don't know how I would have got out of that place. I probably would have feathered the clutch a little bit differently than what I did. But anyways, my dad would have had a, an extreme temptation to yell at me, and I think maybe he did. <laughs> Okay? But he's human, right? Temptations come from trials, from adversity. You know, if your wife crashes the car, right, and uh, you weren't there, she says, oh, it was slippery, and I ran it into the fence. Okay, well, maybe you're going too fast around the corner. It's snowing outside. Come on, right? What kind of lousy driver are you anyways? Where would you learn how to drive? Temper. Well, if you have those kind of things happening often enough, turn, you're going to have trouble in your marriage relationship, aren't you? If 
you're constantly criticizing your spouse when they do something that's not quite the way you think it should be done or something that was r done wrongly. Well, you're, she's human just like you are. and It's easy for us to see the wrong that our spouse does and not see the wrong that we do sometimes, the things that we make mistakes in, right? But if you, if you start to do that kind of thing and it establishes it's at a pattern, your marriage relationship's going to suffer and the intimacy in your marriage is going to be, you know, you, you see the, you know, two people with their faces turned opposite ways, you know, sleeping on the edge of the outside of the bed, you know, like, well, hey, those kind of circumstances, if it goes on long enough, you might just be tempted to find intimacy somewhere else. That's where affairs happen, right? You see the digression? Trials can come, morph into temptations. And sadly, some people reach the conclusion because evil things happen to them or to others around them, that God, God must be the author of evil. Such thinking concludes that God has made things such hard, so hard for them that the only way out is to sin. And then they blame God for sinning. Not outright, maybe. But they'll say some things to themselves, like, well, I just don't have the power to resist that like some other people do. Um, God expects too much from me in my emotionally fragile state. The pressures are just great. I had to do it. My wife makes me sin. She does things and says things that I can't handle and my temper gets the best of me. I had a dysfunctional upbringing. Look at what I went through as a child. So, what do you expect? Should, should you expect me to be, to be good in this area? After everything I've been through, don't I deserve a break? And I think I deserve a case of beer to cheer me up, don't you think? I'm genetically disposed to doing what I'm doing. I can't help myself. You see the pattern? In some way or another, all of the attitudes that I just mentioned here that are used to justify behaviors that are wrong are really saying that God tempted me to sin. God put me in that situation to fall. Therefore, I'm not really to blame. My sin is understandable and it's excusable and blame for sins not on me, really. But it's actually on God who made me this way. So, James has something to say about this. James actually has a rebuke on anyone who places the blame for temptations and evil on God. He says in verse 13 of James chapter 1, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And James knew that human nature, that sinful nature, that fallen nature, has a tendency to blame God when they find themselves in the midst of trials of temptation. Yet by his very nature, God, who is holy in and through, completely holy, he is unable to either be tempted or to tempt others to do evil. Charles Spurgeon said this once. He said, Satan tempts. God tries. But the same trial may be both a temptation and a trial. And it may, may be a trial from God's side and a temptation from Satan's side. Just as Job suffered from Satan, and it was through temptation, but he also suffered from God through Satan, and so it was a trial to him. So, you see, there are times where evil is permitted to test us, to be on our doorstep, and these tests can be difficult, just like that of Job. And Job was called to endure. But we dare not blame God and say that He is the author 
of those temptations, that he is the author of evil. In the book of 1 John, the Apostle John speaks of this when he says in verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Zero. No darkness in God. The bottom line, evil does not have its root in the Lord. Unlike his created beings, God is eternal, preeminent, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He was and is and is to come. He was before all things. He is ageless, tireless, faultless. He is beyond human comprehension in the state that we're in. So, if temptation doesn't come from God, where does it come from? The Bible tells us there are two primary sources for evil. Firstly, we know the devil and all of his demons who were original sinners that were cast out of heaven, cast down to the earth. They were rebels. They were the, the original sinners. So, they tempt because their hearts are evil and they hate God. Secondly, it comes from the fallen nature that resides in every human being since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Regarding temptation, the devil, you know, he's a master of temptation and he seeks to lie about the nature of evil. Telling, telling us something that is good when it is not or telling us that something is bad when in fact it is good. He just turns the tables. He does the opposite. But he's a liar and the father of all lies. When he speaks lies, Satan speaks his native language. He speaks into the free wills of human beings who are created in the image of God. Why? Because he wants to corrupt. And he wants to cause destruction. Because when God created people in the world, he said, it is very good. The devil hates God. And he hates everything that God loves. And God loves you. So that puts him as your adversary. And he's going to try everything he can do to lie to you, to get you to believe his lies so that you look at good and you call it bad. And so that you look at bad and that you call it good. Because if he knows, he knows that if he can get you there, then he's going to have his way and that is, he's going to have his way in destroying your life. So death came into the world since the garden. Right? Well, when, when Eve was tricked to take a bite of the forbidden fruit, in Genesis 3, after Satan told Eve that she would not die if she ate the fruit, even though God said that she would, Satan told uh, Eve that she would be actually like God, knowing good from evil. So Eve was enticed to commit the first sin. In Genesis 3, 6, we read, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some of it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So death comes into the world because of this lie, because Eve took that bite, that first bite. And Adam saw what she was doing and he went right along with it. And he took a bite too. So God's curse came upon the land, upon the earth. Genesis 3, 16-19. A curse of pain and death was given to humanity after the fall. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. My goodness, ladies, you guys go through it when you give birth to babies. I was just up in Prince George witnessing my daughter go through it, and it was complicated, and it was bad. And I've heard of other scenarios here that have happened too where this is a difficult thing, and there's trials with this. So, part of the fall was this painful childbearing. 
Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said this, Because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since, you were take some, f- since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. <laughs> wow. Haven't we experienced that in our work lives? Yeah, we do. Paul the Apostle caps this principle in Romans 5.12 where he says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through this one man, and death came through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. So Satan played this game with Adam and Eve, and he continues to play the game with all people. He spawns and then he plants a lie within the mind of a person concerning something God has either forbidden or encouraged. Telling them that the best course of action is to do the polar opposite of what God has suggested. He always suggests that if we do opposite to what God tells us, somehow, somehow that's going to enrich our lives. But he is a liar. Saints of God, he's a liar. He knows that our rebellion will negatively affect our relationship with the Lord. Now, I know that we're believers here, and we're going to talk about that, okay? James focuses his attention on the evil desires that are latent within the sinful nature of every man and woman, even though as a believer, you've come to newness, you've been given a new nature, you've been born again, there's still this nature that was passed on to you from Adam way back when. All of us have this. Concerning the nature that was passed on to us in verse 14, temptation. But each person is tempted, James says in verse 14, when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And in verse 15 he says, Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full full grown, gives birth to death. So the truth of the matter is that since Adam and Eve, no man or woman is exempt from being tempted to follow a desire for some wrong thing. And that includes Christians. Just because you come, become a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to somehow skirt temptation. I was talking to someone at Bible study this week, and we were talking a little bit about this. and It's kind of like, you know, as Christians, you can't keep the crows from flying over your head, but you can certainly keep them from landing on your shoulder. You don't have to invite them and let them land there and perch, right? As human beings, you're going to be tempted. The Lord was tempted like we were, yet without sin. So, if a person deliberately dwells on, contemplates, and nourishes fulfilling an evil desire, that desire will grow in power until it becomes fully grown and monstrously strong. You guys are aware of this. You've lived this long. You understand this, right? Inevitably, if that temptation is not put into check, it will come to roost in the form of evil obsessions or actions. And it doesn't matter how strong you think you are. If you're not careful, you will end up falling into sin. That's why the Scriptures tell us to watch our life and doctrine closely. Be careful. Be alert. All men are alike under the power of sin. As believers in Jesus, I want to talk to you about this, though. You are living in the age of God's grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus has done for us in sacrificing Himself on the cross, God has made a way for the power of sin inside the believers 
to be broken. Now, I've heard people say, I'm a Christian. And because they're continually finding themselves falling into a temptation and yielding to that temptation, they're saying, just like we started off saying, well, I'm just, I don't know, I'm not like other people. I don't have the backbone to say no to this. No. Folks, you don't have to sin anymore. I'm not saying that you're not going to. All of us are going to. But you don't have to. Why? Because the power of sin has been broken by the blood of Jesus Christ over you. You do not have to yield to the desires of your, na- your old Adamic nature any longer. See who the Son has set free. He shall be free indeed. You don't have to capitulate to the tempter. When the tempter comes and he tries to roost something on you, you can say, Jesus, I need your help. I reject that and I push away from that. Why? Because greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. The Spirit of God gives you the power to overcome. I'm tired of hearing this. Oh, I've got grace, so I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and you know, God understands me and I'm not really going to. No! No! Grace is given to you for salvation and it's given to you so that you can be overcomers. Not so that you can capitulate and, 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 and just go for sacrifice. God desires obedience rather than sacrifice. Yes, your sins are covered by the blood of Christ. Thank goodness, because we all make mistakes. We all make bad decisions at times. None of us here can say that we're not going to sin in, in the future. We can't say that because we don't know what the future is. And we're in this wrestle, right? But we don't have to sin. We don't have to sin. See? Jesus. Jesus came to us as the Savior. We have an advantage over unbelievers in the world. And we also have have an advantage over the Israelites in the Old Testament times. The stories that were given to show us the nature of man and the, the, the natural progression. We, we have an advantage. What is that advantage? You see, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the blood of Christ cleanses the sin from inside of you and cleans you up. He washes the sin away and cleans the, the vessel that was made for God to dwell in inside of each, every human being. Inside of every person is a God-shaped place where God was meant to be at one with. But sin corrupted that, and God can't be in a place that is not holy. That's why Jesus' blood is so precious, because Jesus' blood is holy. Jesus' blood cleanses us from sin. When He sacrificed Himself, God knew that there was no other way. He loved us so much that He gave Himself. God became flesh and came down to us. Why? To die for us so that we could be cleaned on the inside. When we accept His his sacrifice, we are justified, made just as if we had never sinned. Thank you. That is beautiful. That is beautiful salvation. Just as if I never sinned. Clean. When before I I was unclean, now I am clean. And He does this so that we can be at one with Him. Because we were meant to be a place where God dwells. And that's why the temple, all that on the outside, has now moved inside. When you accept Jesus as your Savior and He cleans you out, it makes a clean place, a holy place, for the Spirit of God to live in. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? He loves you. He gave everything for you. Your Creator did not want you to suffer from this separation that occurs as a result of sin. He's called you by name. He's called you to become at one with Him again. That's what atonement is. It means at one meant. At one with God, just like before the fall. The new Eden is inside of the heart of the believer where we walk with God where we talk with Him. We have fellowship with Him in this garden of our hearts. You see, the old Adam brought death. 
the new Adam, Jesus, brings life and peace. And that life and peace inside of us means that he gives us overcoming power to say no to where before we were slaves to sin, where we were, were driven along by our desires and we just capitulated to those and our minds were darkened and clouded. Now all of a sudden, God has given us a spirit so we can, we can say, Lord, you know in my flesh that I'm weak and that I'm going to capitulate to this temptation if it's not for your grace. So God, I love you. I want to serve you. I don't want to be like that anymore. I want to live for you wholeheartedly devoted to you. And we bow the knee of our hearts to the Lord and the Spirit gives us power to be overcomers. God wants us to be overcomers. And not just to say that because we have a sinful nature to admit defeat. I'm just the way I am. That's always the way I've been. I have all this background. I have all this stuff. God's like, you know what? There is nothing impossible for me. I can take your stuff and I can deliver you from that stuff. I can set you free so that you can be holy as I am holy. The Lord commands it. He says, be holy as I am holy. Thus says the Lord. Be holy as I am holy. Why? Did he say something to us that's unattainable? No, it's not unattainable. But it's not by works. It's not by our own scheme, I guess you could say, our own efforts that we're going to be holy. We're holy when we fall deeply in love with Jesus and He becomes our everything. We love Him so much that we want to please Him. We want to serve Him. And then it pours out so that we see others who are made in the image of God and how much He loves them. And our love for them is such that we don't want to do wrong to them because God has filled us with His love and he's made us. Um, he's made us participators with him in the divine nature. You see what I'm saying? So, in your struggle with temptation, you are not alone. All of us go through this. Yes, there is a trial with temptation. The trial of temptation did not come from God. Yes, you've got an enemy. Yes, you've got a, an Adamic nature that, has, that follows along with you. But you do not have to listen to that nature any longer. Ephesians 2, 1-6 says this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Listen to this. All of us, and that means all, also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we are by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You see that beautiful word? There's hope, people. Don't give way. Yes, the birds are going to fly over your head. They are. The temptations are going to come. Whether it's temptation to anger, temptation to covet, temptation to lust, temptation to whatever. That is, temptation to walk away when you know you should be helping someone. Because you've got other things to do. Th these are all temptations that fly overhead. Do we have to listen to them? No. This says right here. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's what this is saying. God has given you his Holy Spirit. He's given you his word, which we just read. And his spirit brings the word to life so you can be overcomers. And you, you, you know, sin, we're, when we do sin, creates this distance between us and, and the Lord, right? Even though you're his child, you don't feel close to him. God wants you to feel close to him. He wants you to be close to him. Draw near unto the Lord, and He will draw near unto you. He wants you to live your lives in closeness with Him. If you give Jesus everything you are and everything you have, He will reveal His fullness to you. you there's a, there's, a, there's a, a movement right now going down on in a student campus in Asbury. 
down in the States. You guys maybe have heard about it, where the, the students are gathering together, and it's just simple. It's not, there's no weird stuff happening there. People are simply coming before God and repenting, and they're saying, Jesus, we need you. We need you to help us in this world. Lord, have mercy on us. Flow through us. Live in us. And it's turned into this worship thing and prayer thing where, where people are praying for one another. It's been going on for weeks now. Well, this is God's desire that we're close to Him. And you know what? When we're close to Him, the world sees. The world sees us as we are. If we're compromising and we have all these other priorities in our lives that are over God, oh, maybe my hobbies are more important. Maybe my work's more important. Maybe, you know, all these things are more important than God. There's going to be a dullness in your spirit that's not going to be attractive out there. And I've been living in that life before. I don't want to go there. I don't want to be there anymore. I don't know about you, God wants to do good things in your life and through your life. He wants you to impact your neighbors. He wants to impact this community for, for the gospel. And the only way that's going to happen is if we humble ourselves before Him. Say, Lord, help us when temptation comes our way to say no. And to say, Lord, I love you. I want to serve you. I want to live for you. There's this wrestling match taking place, but the victor is sure. There's an old song by Petra. But to judgment we all must endure. There's war going on. There is war going on in the, in the spiritual realm. But you've not been left alone. He's given you His full armor. The breastplate of righteousness. The shield of faith. The sword of the Spirit. The belt of truth. The feet prepared with, with the gospel of peace. Like the covering over the feet. All this armor. The helmet of salvation. These things were given to us to put on. So that when the day of evil comes, we may be able to stand, having done everything to stand. The provisions are here, people. They're here. They've been given by God to us. We just have to step out and put our trust in Him. And that's putting our trust in Him. When it's hard, what do we call that? Faith. Faith isn't something we work up. It's something we step out in. Trust the Lord. Trust His Word. Step out in faith. Be be radically committed to loving God wholeheartedly. And all the other things will take care of themselves. You pursue the Lord in a relationship with Him and His holiness and watch as the, the light of heaven beams on you and shines through you. That's what we need to do as a church to be this beacon of light and holiness out there in a world of darkness and evil. Hmm. Huh. We need dependence on God, don't we, to do this. can't work this up. You can't do it on your own. I can't just beat you on the head with a sermon and go, yeah, get out there and do the right things and don't do the wrong things. You know, like, no, that's not going to work. That's not God's way. <laughs> Paul said it this way. He says, he writes to the believers in the Ephesians church in Ephesians 1, 17 to 23. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that, what? So that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Are you listening to this? And his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. 
That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order to know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. It is like the power he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and exerted him and, and seated him in the, at the right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is invoked not only in the present age but also the age to come. And, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. See, sometimes we look at that scripture and we go, oh, that's, that's, you know, you know, that's for missionaries, you know, when they go out there and they have this incredible power to, to do the things that God's called. Yeah, it is. True it is. It is. Our missionaries walk in this and, and, and God works through them in this power, right? Yes, that's true. But did you know this is talking to all the saints? You here today are a child of God. If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you've asked Jesus to be your Lord. The Spirit of God lives in you. You are a saint, not because of your works, but because of the grace of God that's been given to you. And because the grace of God has been given to you, the Spirit of God has been given to you to live in you and to live through you. And that's why you, as a little believer here in 100 Mile, just like me as a little pastor here in this obscure little place in 100 Mile, right? <laughs> you have been given the treasuries and the power of heaven to be overcomers in this life. Not to capitulate to the world and everything that the world stands for, but to stand strong and to be holy and to shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life to the people around you in the circle that God's placed you in. What does this mean? It's far above all rule, power, and authority, and dominion, and every name that can be evoked. God placed all things under the feet of Jesus. And Jesus is the head of his church. You are the bride of Christ. You are the body of Christ. You fall under this because he, the head of it, is the head over everything. Therefore, he's given you everything that you need for life and godliness. All you have to do is walk out and step out in faith and believe the Lord for what his promises are. Believe the Lord. Take a stand and do the right thing because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You do not have to take seconds. The Lord has said that you are his child. And you can be holy as he is holy. Okay. He's not abandoned us. And I'm going to end with this. James. James ties it up. Because there's a deception out there to say that it's too difficult. There's too much evil out there for you to overcome. You can't you can't ever be what God's called you to be, so might as well not even try, just sort of float around. No, I don't know. James says this, verse 16 of our text. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Notice how he calls them dear. <laughs> Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might become a kind of first fruits of all that he created. Isn't that beautiful? He set us free. He, he's given us freedom. And all we have to do is bend our knee and ask Him to live through us and ask Him to give us the power to be overcomers and to shine for Him. Amen. Let's bow in prayer.